From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. There is no clear path forward for Ukraine aid in the House as the White House dismissed as Speaker Mike Johnson's request for a meeting to discuss the border. We'll speak with members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, Republican Mike Lawler of New York and Democrat Gwen Moore of Wisconsin. Donald Trump is eyeing a makeover of NATO and peace in Ukraine if he wins the election. We'll talk with former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Kate Bailey Hutchison. And police say one person has died and many others were injured in a shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade this afternoon. We're following this developing story. And this really is developing at this hour. Joe, we know of at least one fatality. Multiple others, though, have been injured. We do know that two individuals who are armed have been arrested. That's yes. essentially the extent of the information that we know at this point. But we do know that the White House has been briefed on this. Yeah, that's uh, for sure. In fact, we have a statement from the White House on this, letting us know that the president uh, has been briefed on the limited information that's out there. White House officials have been in touch with state and local leaders, federal law enforcement on the scene supporting local law enforcement. And so it's on the radar here in Washington, D.C., and we'll have a lot more for you over the course of this hour on Balance of Power as we learn more. Kaylee, of course, we just got an update from authorities in the last half hour that we brought our viewers and listeners here on Bloomberg. And we'll stick with this as we learn more. Absolutely. We will keep you apprised of any and all developments as we get them. But meantime, there have been many developments here in Washington today, or perhaps a lack thereof when it comes to progress toward advancing the bill passed by the Senate that would provide more than $60 billion in aid for Ukraine, Israel, and other allies, uh, more than 95, rather, 60 specifically for Ukraine. The issue is, for the House, it didn't include the border. That's something Mike Johnson wanted to discuss potentially with the president, but White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre threw a bit of cold water on that at the briefing today. What is there to negotiate? Really, truly, what is the one-on-one -on -one negotiation about when he's been presented with exactly what he asked for? So he's negotiating with himself. He's killing bills on his own. I think the speaker's confused. I think the speaker doesn't understand what it is that his job is. Put that bill to the floor. Put that bill to the floor. It will get bipartisan support. Joining us now are Bloomberg's Mike Dorning, who lead, helps lead our congressional coverage here in Washington, as is Julie Fine, joining us from Dallas, where she is our Texas bureau chief. So, Mike, just to begin with you, if the White House and Mike Johnson aren't going to talk, and the House, in fact, is heading out of town after tomorrow, last vote is Thursday at 2.30 p.m., they won't be back until February 28th. It feels like the supplemental package is going nowhere fast in the other chamber. Well, right now it looks like a very tough situation in the House for the Ukraine aid. It's possible that over time they could use this uh, kind of convoluted process called a discharge petition where you slowly get a majority to sign a petition to force it. There's some problems with that. And as you say, they're taking a two-week vacation now before they even come back and start on that. One of the problems with that could be progressive Democrats. It's interesting. We're not Absolutely. just counting Republican votes, but progressives who are not happy about Joe Biden's policy toward Israel. There are billions for Israel uh, in this legislation. Is that what's going to really stop this from happening? Well, it's a combination of how many progressives uh, are too upset with the campaign in Gaza and yeah. the civilian casualties there. We don't know how many there will be, but we know there'll be at least some that wouldn't sign on to this. And then on the other hand, there are these kind of national security Republicans. How many of them are willing to kind of stand up and possibly be the uh, target of like Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans, which are their primary base voters. So these two like little dials, we don't know where they're going to go. But we do know one thing. It's going to be slow, delayed, while Ukraine needs aid if they go this route. Well, and much will depend on the decisions of Speaker Johnson, who we know has a very close relationship with the aforementioned mentioned Donald Trump. And we heard from the Speaker on this package this morning. Take a listen. We are not going to be uh, forced into action by the Senate, who in the latest product they sent us over does not have one word in the bill about 
America's border. So what we're doing right now is we, the House is working its will. The House Republican Conference, we just met an, an hour ago uh, with all the members, and there are lots of ideas on the table of how to address these issues. We will address the issues. We'll do our duty on that matter. And, uh, and, and all that begins in earnest right now. But... Julie, fine. Maybe this bill doesn't have a word on the border, but there was a bill that had many words on the border. It was a border deal, and the House said we don't want it. Help us make sense of this. Well, this one's a tough one to make sense of. This is one that Republicans are going to have to answer about, and you can just look at last night's election to show for that. I mean, the, Rep the Democrats did pass in the Senate a border bill. The Republicans said no after saying we want a border bill, a border bill that went further than many have in the past. This now becomes an election issue. This is something that the speaker is going to be asked about, especially right now. Well, I'll tell you one thing uh, they did pass last evening uh, was the impeachment of the Homeland Security Secretary by all of one vote. Alejandro Mayorkas has a New distinction now, uh, Julie. Chuck Schumer called it a sham and another embarrassment for House Republicans. It's expected to die very quietly in the Senate, likely in committee. Has the message been delivered, or was there more to this? Well, I mean, I think the Republicans got this done. You know, they tried to do it a week ago. They were not able to do that. Obviously embarrassing for the House Speaker. So, sure, they've delivered a message, but to what end? The Senate likely to get rid of this fairly quickly. So, yes, the message is out there that we don't feel good about the border. But, again, then you can turn back around, and Democrats likely will, too. Okay, we gave you a solution. You know, what happens from here? Yeah, well, and it's worth keeping in mind that this impeachment vote did happen yesterday. If the vote were to happen, say, on February 28th, Mike, once Tom Swazi, the Democrat from New York, in the race that Julie was alluding to, New York 3, the special election yesterday to replace George Santos, they wouldn't have been able to take that vote because the margin gets even tighter. So now Absolutely. how much incrementally more difficult is it for Mike Johnson to get anything done in this House, be it something to aid Ukraine or just a funding bill to avoid a shutdown come a few weeks well, from now. Literally, it's one-third more difficult. He <laughs> used to be able to lose three Republicans. Yes, now he can only lose two Republicans. And one of those Republicans might be Matt Gates, and the other Marjorie Taylor Greene. And then you just need one more, and everything's stopped. So this just makes things much harder for him to get anything done. And the Ukraine situation is going to be tough on him. Also, keeping the government funded mm -hmm. is going to be tough on him because the Democratic Senate and the Democratic White House are not going to roll over and do exactly right. what the conservatives want. Well, that's want. the question right now is, are we going to shut down three weeks from tomorrow? That's when the beginning of this would, would happen. No one seems to be talking about it. We're asking a lot of folks here on this program but there are six legislative days left, if, uh, if my count is correct. Or they'll have only three when they come back yep. from recess. Are we shutting down? Um, we, they haven't done the, the sort of setting up to avoid a shutdown. It looks very dire, but I know I'm a broken record on this, but I think that Speaker Johnson has telegraphed by the way he's handled the other shutdown threats that he yep. really wants to avoid one. So I actually don't think the odds of a shutdown, much less an extended shutdown, are that high. That said, it's going to be tough to do, and I don't see a clear path. And, Julie, as we talk about the issues that resonate with voters <clears throat> in New York 3 or elsewhere, a border definitely is front of mind. What about government, government funding? We always have the question of who ultimately is going to shoulder the blame for that. What do we actually think comes well, I think in terms nobody, of blame? Nobody wants to shoulder the blame for that, especially right now. It's an election year. You know, Mike, you just talked about how this is a very short period of time. And again, it is. But there will be so much blame to go around if there is a shutdown. Both parties, of course, blaming the other. Nobody wants to deal with that in election year, especially this is happening right before Super Tuesday and all these big states coming up. So there will be plenty of blame and there will be a lot of reasons why people want to avoid that. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Julie Fine and Mike Dorning for a great conversation. And thanks for your insights elsewhere today. Gary Gensler says that he will not rush the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's sweeping agenda to get ahead of possible political changes in Washington. The SEC chair also weighing in on climate disclosure issues, speaking earlier today with Bloomberg's David Weston. 
something like 90% of the top 1,000 companies in the U.S. by market cap disclose something about climate. Over half do disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. So there we have a role to bring some consistency, some comparability. You can compare and contrast. That's our role. It's a securities market role, not a climate role. Coming up, we turn to geopolitics, NATO, and the war in Ukraine. In a conversation with former U.S. permanent representative to NATO, Kay Bailey Hutchison. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. It is a big freaking deal, uh, to use the Internet's uh, colloquial slang. Quoting Joe Biden. Of course. Yeah. But look, it's in some ways it's not a surprise because he's called NATO obsolete. He said that he will not defend Europe if they're attacked. Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council with us at this time yesterday, talking about Donald Trump's remarks about NATO over the weekend, comments that are amplified in new reporting now from Bloomberg that the former president is considering scaled back commitments to some NATO members, as well as a push for Ukraine to negotiate an end to the war if he wins the election. Joining us now to get into this and some other issues, former U.S. permanent representative to NATO, Kay Bailey Hutchison. Uh, Madam Ambassador, it's great to see you. Welcome back to Bloomberg. Our reporting suggests that Donald Trump and allies are talking about a two-tiered NATO alliance in which Article 5 would apply only to those who are paying uh, the correct amount and hitting defense spending goals, according to those talking with Bloomberg. Would that be the end of NATO as we know it? Oh, it certainly would. And, you know, I think we need to dis discern there are bills to pay for the NATO operations. Everybody pays that. No one has ever complained about it. But the 2 percent on the defense expenditures is what I think the president is trying to talk about. And mm -hmm. that is where his urging, and he should take some credit for increasing the European uh, buying of the, the armor and the tanks and the airplanes that we need. But it does not, it would never be the alliance that we have known that has been the oldest alliance in the history of the world if we don't keep the Article 5 commitment, and the others must continue to go up. Uh, as Secretary General Stoltenberg said, 18 members have met that goal. And in some cases, for instance, if you are purchasing airplanes, like Germany is, is purchasing F-35s for American workers to make, and also it, Finland is, but you can't order them today and get them today. You ha It takes a year or more to get uh, a line of F-35s or F-16s. So th we're in this together. And I think that's the point. All of us should be working together to, yes, beef up our defense, because we know Russia is at the door and knocking. But yes. also, we need to make sure that we're working in sync and building our defenses, and also uh, in technology, making sure that we're sharing better. You know, the EU is taxing American uh, big tech, and that's not good either. And we are saying we're not going to uh, have the natural gas, the LNG, that we want to export mm -hmm. to Germany and other European countries. What do we, this is an alliance that should all be together, and that's what I think we should be promoting. Well, and to the point on the share of GDP that these countries are spending to fortify the alliance, the estimates in 2023, if you look at the states that really are bordering potentially the threat here, Estonia, 2.7 percent of GDP, Latvia, 2.3, Lithuania, 2.5, Poland, 3.9. It seems that these are the very same countries that could face the greatest threat should Vladimir Putin decide that he wants to take this beyond Ukraine. Do comments like from the former president that would suggest that perhaps they would not, the U.S. would not come to the immediate defense of any partner, make it all the more likely that Putin might take that further step? I think it is a very bad signal to, to Putin to, to say something like that, which will not happen. 
There is no way that Congress would allow this. Congress has passed a law that the president cannot withdraw from NATO, nor can it stop expenditures that uh, must be made in the support of NATO without congressional approval. But a president approval. could decide not to send the troops, just ignore Article 5, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. That is a commitment that is made in a treaty. You can't you can't walk away from a treaty obligation without renouncing the treaty. He can't renounce the treaty because it would take a two-thirds vote of the Senate to do that. So I don't think that's an option. And I, I think the president has, for many years, just in a bombastic way, uh, tried to make a point. And I think this point is the wrong one to make. We need to come together with our European allies and solidify against our adversaries. That includes Russia. It includes the potential of China, Iran, North Korea. And we have to be united and together to do that. Of course, Ambassador, this all ties into the situation right now in Ukraine. Donald Trump also apparently wants to get Vladimir Putin and uh, uh, Vladimir Zelensky at the table to have peace talks and end the war, as he says, in the 24 hours after he gets elected. But there's a big debate about funding Ukraine underway, as you well know, in Washington. And we heard about that today from the Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin. Love to hear his remarks and then have you respond. Here he is. We won't back down. Ladies and gentlemen, later this month, we will mark two full years since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of its peaceful and democratic neighbor, Ukraine. The Kremlin keeps on betting that we will all lose interest in Ukraine and that our support will f flicker and fade. But I am more determined than, than, than ever, and I know that you are as well. Two years, Ambassador. It's pretty remarkable as we do hear fatigue coming from some lawmakers here in Washington. As you look forward to what's happening, many of them and many Republicans specifically are asking for an exit plan. They want to know how this war can end before giving more money. Do they deserve that plan? Of course we want a plan, but you have to start with the victory. There has to be a... And what the defense secretary said is right. We have... they. Putin thinks that we will lose interest. We cannot lose interest because Putin has already told his populace and his military that he wants to recreate the Soviet Union, which means he is going to have plans if he gets Ukraine to go into one of these Baltic countries or Poland or, or Finland or Romania. And if we stop him now, then our troops will not be on the ground in Europe. But if we don't stop him and he thinks he that we've lost interest and he's going to go forward and uh, disrupt another sovereign nation, as he has done with Ukraine, that is a sign of weakness. That is not the American position. I think Secretary Austin was absolutely right. And if we don't want our boots on the ground in Europe, we need to fight right now, help Ukraine, because their boots are on the ground, ours are not. But we can give them the arms to fight for their country, and that's what we cannot lose interest in doing. Well, Ambassador, you are right now joining us from Texas, a border state in which there are congressional representatives who are saying our own border needs to be protected before we take any further action to protect the borders of someone else. What would you say to Republicans who are now espousing that idea, using it as justification not to pass aid to Ukraine? I, I think we do need border control. That is the number one issue in America right now, is border control on our border. We are being inundated. We, are, we cannot sustain this kind of uh, not knowing who is here, illegal crossings and not doing what can be done. I think the president could do more on his own and stop really blaming Congress. But I think Congress should also uh, get that bill back up and negotiate and pass something that gives even more tools to stop this infiltration of our border. I think the president needs to do more and I think Congress should come come in and let's start debating instead of saying, well, we're not going to take up the bill because it doesn't do enough. Well, right. I, I think sec 
I think Senator Langford did a great job with Chris and Cinema in trying to move forward. We would have been in a better position if we had, but now we are where we are, and I think they should bring it back up. It's the number one if issue. If we can't in get a bill to the floor, though, if we can't get a bill to the floor, Ambassador, should Ukraine have to wait? I think now that we have the foreign policy bills up, I think we should help Ukraine right now. They deserve it, and it will be for our security and our protection if we give it to them. But I would not give up on the border control in our country either, and I, I would call on Congress and the president to start meeting and yeah. strengthening the U.S. border. All right, former U.S. Permanent Representative to NATO, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time, Ambassador. And coming up, we'll have an update here at home on the shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Parade. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. There were shots fired on the west side of Union Station. Immediately, officers responded to the area, took two people into custody, and also immediately rendered life-sustaining aid to those victims. We're still gathering information on the number and the status of victims. But like I said, we know that one of the victims is deceased. That was Kansas City Police Chief Stacy Graves minutes ago. As she said, one person has been killed and at least nine others hurt from gunshots at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade earlier today. Two people are in custody. Thousands of fans were celebrating their team's win over San Francisco Sunday night. Star quarterback Patrick Mahomes tweeted out praying for Kansas City. And just incredible to see what was supposed to be a day of celebration, Joe, ending in in a violent way, and according to the Gun Violence Archive, this is the 47th mass shooting of the year on February 14th, 2024, which also happens to be the sixth anniversary of the shooting in Parkland, Florida at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, in which 17 individuals lost their lives, and one at least has lost their life today as a result of this. Once again, we're with you live on Bloomberg talking about law enforcement. As Chief Graves said earlier today, running into harm's way, which has become part of the American story, unfortunately. And we'll keep you posted as we learn more information. Coming up, we go to the House of Representatives for views from both sides of the aisle today. We'll speak with New York Republican lawmaker Mike Lawler, as well as Wisconsin Democrat Gwen Moore. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Last night, the House voted to approve articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas. Desperate times call for desperate measures. We had to do that. He has abdicated his responsibility, he's breached the public trust, and he's disregarded the laws Congress has passed. That was House Speaker Mike Johnson earlier on the heels of the House vote to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. We're joined now by Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies, and Jim Kessler, Third Way Executive Vice President. Our panel today, it's great to see you both here. Maura, they got it done with one vote. A little different than what we saw the first time around, now that Steve Scalise is back. Not lost on us that if that vote were held tonight, it wouldn't pass because New York 3 flipped to the Democrats last night in a special election. Was that worth the exercise? I don't think that it was if this is the only victory, and we'll use that uh, term loosely here, uh, for their con uh, Congress. I mean, if this is what they've accomplished, what does that really say for the this House GOP? Uh, I think when you're looking at the failures of the Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration, uh, when it comes to the border policies, the best way to do that is uh, on Election Day. Mm -hmm. It's not by circumventing the oath that members have taken for the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think this is the right decision. I think it does... Uh, really downplay the severity and the seriousness of which the impeachment clause should be taken yeah. by members of Congress. 
Well, what they alleged and ultimately impeached him for, they say, is a failure to do his job in addressing what's happening at the border, even though that job is just enforcing the policies of the Biden administration. And the question of addressing the border, Jim, is one they maybe had a chance to do legislatively with the deal that was struck by Senate negotiators. They did not want to. But it seems the fact that this new supplemental package the Senate has passed because it doesn't include the border makes it dead on arrival in the House. Does this make any any sense to you? Well, you use the three words, do your job, and mm -hmm. the House Republicans aren't doing their job. You know, they had an opportunity, and look, this got killed because of Donald Trump, and it got killed in the Senate, but there was a historic bipartisan border deal that really would have made a difference. I mean, the biggest border security deal we've had in three decades, it got destroyed because of Republicans and because of Donald Trump. The Mayorkas impeachment is a bit of a, of a theater, there and um, you know I, I think we've got problems with the Ukraine bill right now too. So do your job is the, is a good motto. Well, but the dysfunction in the House, maybe it's Donald Trump's uh, repeated phone calls to the Speaker, has left leadership on both sides of the aisle uh, in a quandary here in the Senate. You spent a lot of years working for Chuck Schumer. Even Mitch McConnell is wondering what to do next. Are, are they powerless in this scenario? Well, I don't know, because things change, and I think the election in New York 3 with Tom Suozzi winning, and winning, frankly, mm. on the immigration issue, which the last time a Democrat did that, I think it was John Adams. But um, and he wasn't a Democrat. That was Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, look, as long as they're talking, there's a chance. Schumer and McConnell want to get this done. Jeffries wants to get this done. The person standing in the way is Mike Johnson with his older brother, T Donald Trump. You're making me think well. about the founding fathers here, and I do wonder <laughs> what they would think if they were to witness uh, Congress in the modern day. And, of course, Maura, you've worked for a speaker in the past. How much power is actually in the hands of Speaker Johnson? Is he really in control here? Well, it's interesting that he brought up saying, you know, I want to let the House work its will. Letting the House work its will is bringing legislation to the floor and offering up amendments if you don't like certain parts of it. Allow your members to bring up amendments. See what happens. Let the House work its will on legislation that the Senate has, the Senate has passed. So, you know, I think in, in that regards, he could absolutely do that. You know, unfortunately, I don't think that Speaker Johnson has clearly laid out a plan, and that's for several reasons, one of which I don't think he has a plan. And that's hard to come, come up there and say he has one when he doesn't, uh, and, and just to say, we're going to work through it, we're going to go do appropriations. That's all fine and go, but your members need to know where you are, where you stand, and what the actual plan is. So do we start shutting down three weeks from tomorrow? I certainly hope not. That's not going to help Republicans. That's not going to help this country, and that's not going to help our allies around the world. Job would be on the line potentially if he does another short. And again, that throws everything into chaos. It throws everything that Congress needs to be working on up in the air yet again, and we really can't afford that. Uh, we've seen the the effects of a chaotic Capitol Hill, and it's not good for anyone. I do think one thing is interesting on the immigration border issues that people aren't even talking about. You know, they went to go impeach Mayorkas, mm -hmm. largely symbolically, right? This is not because of anything he did that, you know, was egregious. Uh, but Kamala Harris was assigned to be the border czar back in 21. No one's calling out Kamala Harris for her role or lack thereof on the yeah. border. I think it's interesting that they targeted... Well, I did, because I think that it's interesting that Republicans haven't. I mean, what an opportunity they completely missed uh, by going after Mayorkas, and instead they should have been questioning Kamala Harris this whole time. Okay, well, so let's talk further about the Biden-Harris administration. You made the point, Jim, that Tom Suozzi just won in New York in part because of the way he was able to message on immigration and the border. Part of that message was calling on Biden to shut the border down, being quite hawkish about it, frankly. And I just wonder if that is something that's going to work in November for other Democrats when Biden is at the top of the ticket. And ultimately, does Biden not have to own this issue? Right. So you, you mentioned earlier, Mike Johnson, you know, doesn't seem to have a plan. Well, nobody has a plan after you've been punched in the nose, which is <laughs> a Mike Tyson uh -huh. line. And that's what just happened in New York 3. And the time for message bills and message impeachments are over. Like, there is actually a really strong bipartisan border security bill that's actual action that Congress can do. So Biden's vulnerabilities on the border, which are real, changed a great deal last night when Tom Suozzi capitalized on the bipartisan bill 
that Joe Biden was really behind and helped negotiate and said this is what should be done instead of the clown show that we're seeing in Washington. So, yes, I do think it's a turning point. It was a good night for Democrats and a good night for Joe Biden. You yeah. worked across the aisle from Mitch McConnell for years. Has his time come? Yeah, hard to say. It's been a tough couple of weeks. For it's, been, it's been hard, and I've never seen Mitch McConnell retreat the way he retreated with Donald Trump there. Look, I, he feels this is his, I think, his last battle to preserve this country, to preserve this democracy. And, you know, look, he's going to have to bring his A-game. Well, when we talk about people leaving Congress, we've gotten a trickle of committee chairs in the House announcing that they aren't running for re-election. Just this past weekend, it was Mike Gallagher who chairs the China Select Committee. We've had reporting uh, from other sources this evening that Mark Green, who chaired the Homeland Security Committee, who was vital in making this Mayorkas impeachment happen last night, also is not going to run for re-election. Maura, what does it say that all the leaders are deciding they don't want to try to lead in this body anymore? It doesn't bode well for us as a country when you don't have people who, and you know, I'm sure they all had good intentions of running and why they came here in the first place, but that they see this dysfunction and don't see how to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And we need people who want to be part of a solution. We really do need good faith actors com coming up to Capitol Hill to do something uh, for this country. But I, I think a lot of it does, and I'm not just going to sit here and blame Donald Trump for everything, but I really do think that as a party, those who have pledged their undying loyalty to him, really do need to think about what do you even stand for? Because as a party, we have always stood for strong foreign policy. We've always stood for uh, supporting and defending our Constitution and being fierce advocates of a smaller, more accountable government. But so many people in this party and people in, in the Republican conference have just signed away those things and said, I'm here with Donald Trump. Well, he's not going to live forever. So where do they go next? And I think that it's going to be a real reckoning for Republicans if we continue to lose leaders, committee chairmen like Mike Gallagher and more who don't want to be part of this mess. All right. Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies and Jim Kessler, third way executive vice president. President, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Now, coming up, we will turn to the halls of Congress themselves. Wisconsin Congresswoman Grun Moore, the Democrat, will be with us for more on this fight for foreign aid funding and the fight over the border. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I think all options are on the table, but I think it's tragically sad that we are trying to come up with procedural avenues around the most simple and straightforward manner. We're the House of Representatives. We're supposed to take votes up or down. So yes, I am happy to look at all of the other contingencies we could put in place if we are dealing with the reality that the Speaker of the House doesn't want to protect our country. That was Democratic Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger of Virginia speaking with us earlier today, responding to my question about a discharge petition in order to bring the Ukraine aid bill to the floor of the House. And joining us now is another member of the House of Representatives, Democratic Congresswoman Gwen Moore of Wisconsin. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being with us this evening. On this matter of a discharge petition, we've had a lot of conversation about whether there could be enough Republicans who would sign on. But given that this package also provides billions of dollars in unconditional aid to Israel, how many Democrats won't sign on to this? Well, thank you for having me. And I don't want to characterize aid to Israel as a Democrat versus Republican issue. There are very many Democrats that are concerned about uh, funding uh, our ally, Israel, as well as providing the aid to the Palestinians, which is part of this package as well. Uh, and so I think that uh, we'll find that there may be some Democrats that vote, won't vote for the bill. Uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, aid to Israel that is not conditioned. But there will be many Republicans as well that don't want to fund Ukraine. They really don't really see the threat to our democracy that many of us see. And so I think that there will be whip operations on both sides. Uh, should this come to the floor uh, to make sure that there is some kind of package that that, that leaves the House. Uh, as you indicated earlier, 
uh, when you talk to my colleague, Representative uh, Spencer, we don't even know that we're going to see a bill come to the floor because our speaker, uh, Mike Johnson, has said that it won't come. And so we have a discharge petition. And that's an up or down thing. Okay? 218 votes, uh, and that's the trigger for the discharge position. Uh, uh, so we don't have the opportunity, uh, which many of us uh, would like to provide uh, more or less aid to one or more of the entities uh, involved in it. Um, many of us are concerned about uh, unfunding the uh, UN aid um, to uh, a human rights organization that serves the Palestinians. And so, but but this, we won't have the opportunity to amend it. It'll be up or down. Uh, and I think that, um, that we have enough votes that despite objections to individual components of it uh, could really pass. That would be a pretty remarkable moment, uh, Congresswoman. A lot of Republicans are asking for accountability, among other things, uh, before more money is sent to Ukraine. Do you want to see additional strings attached to money for Israel? Well, just let me say, um, I think that our president has really has said the quiet part out loud. A lot of us are very concerned about Israel taking our friendship and our relationship for granted. Uh, and that, you know, you know, Netanyahu continues to brag about the fact that he's not listening to, to us. And it's very clear to some of us that there could be more targeting of capturing and killing uh, active Hamas leaders and not this carpet bombing uh, that we have seen happening. We're very concerned now that the people in Rafah absolutely uh, have nowhere to go. Um, but again, uh, Israel uh, is our ally, uh, and uh, the opportunity to provide those conditions um, has not emerged. It sort of be, will be an up or down vote. And I don't think a lot of people think that um, they having that conversation in the middle of this conflict uh, is appropriate. Congresswoman, finally, on another matter, you do sit on the Ways and Means Committee. Obviously, a tax deal was able to pass, actually, in the House of Representatives, awaiting a vote in the Senate. A test vote on expanding the salt cap, though, just failed in the House. Should that be the end of this effort, or can more work be done on the salt issue in particular? Well, I am, uh, you know, we had, what we had today was the rule for consideration mm -hmm. of salt, and, and that was to eliminate the marriage penalty for salt, which is an entirely different issue than just voting for, for salt. I, I don't think marriage penalties are good. Uh, so I, I think that, um, that that the rule may have gone down, uh, but that was not the vote on salt. Congresswoman, and they, it's good they, to and see they you. had we that salt, they had us. that amendment nested with another one. So I am not sure that Understood. we'll see. Yeah. We're going to talk with an expert next, the man behind that bill, Gwen Moore of Wisconsin. It's great to see you, Congresswoman. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank, <laughs> Thank you for you being so with us. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Let's uh, cross the aisle now and bring in New York Republican Congressman Mike Lawler joining us live from Capitol Hill. Indeed, that was your bill, Congressman, uh, as we start our conversation with an eye on salt. Obviously not the result I'm guessing you want it in the Rules Committee here. Are, are you running out of options when it comes to this issue? Look, we're going to keep fighting uh, for our constituents and hardworking middle-class taxpayers across this country. Uh, as I have said from the very beginning, the uh, cap on salt uh, was nothing more than a pay-for uh, for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, and Democrats uh, in uh, New York voted in mass today against the rule. Uh, so for all their talk uh, for the last six years about the need to lift the cap on salt, uh, this was a real opportunity. The first time uh, that you would have a standalone bill uh, up for a vote on salt, and they voted to kill the rule. Uh, they could have uh, put partisan politics aside. They could have put people first, as Hakeem Jeffries often says, and instead uh, they squarely put politics first by voting down uh, a rule that would have allowed an up or down vote on salt. Uh, so it's disappointing, but uh, 
I'm not deterred. We are going to continue to fight uh, to lift the cap on salt and to provide yeah. immediate tax relief for hardworking uh, middle class families across this country. So, Congressman, what exactly is the next move and when can you make it if the House is about to recess for several weeks and quickly be faced with a potential shutdown if you don't sort out funding first? Well, obviously, the appropriations bills uh, need to be dealt with uh, expeditiously. I know there's been conferencing between uh, the various uh, appropriators in both the Senate and the House, uh, but, you know, we're quickly approaching that March 1st deadline, so we need to act. Uh, but look, salt expires in 2025, the cap on salt. Uh, and I am going to continue to do everything I can between now and then to provide immediate relief, uh, as well as obviously when the tax bill comes up uh, in 2025, to lift the cap, uh, you know, much higher than it is. Uh, the objective has to be to build consensus. This was a real opportunity for Republicans and Democrats who agree on this issue. Uh, to advance this bill. And unfortunately, uh, Democrats uh, voted with uh, 18 Republicans to kill the rule. Uh, and it just, it's unfortunate, really, that um, some of my Democratic colleagues from New York, uh, who have talked a big game about salt, uh, decided to put politics before the people, uh, before their own constituents who need this tax relief. Uh, it's disappointing. Well, I wonder if you see a path in avoiding a shutdown here, Congressman, with what I think is only five or six legislative days left uh, in the House. Does that require a short-term solution? Will there be another continuing resolution, or does that get your speaker fired? Look, I'm not concerned about uh, leadership. We have a job to do. We have a job to do when it comes to governing. Uh, Americans put Republicans in a House majority to serve as a check and balance on this administration to rein in spending. The only way we're going to effectively do that is to pass appropriations bills. Otherwise, we're looking at a continuation of the Pelosi, Schumer, Biden spending policies. So we need to act. Uh, with all due haste and get it done uh, before uh, March 1st and, and the second deadline of March 8th. And so I will uh, be pushing on our leadership to make sure that we get these mm -hmm. bills to the floor for a vote. Uh, and, you know, well, and Speaker Johnson, just like Speaker McCarthy before him, uh, cannot worry about, uh, you know, motions to vacate uh, or other such nonsense. They have to do uh, what is right. Uh, by the American people, and it means moving forward with these appropriations bills. Well, Congressman, if we think about the, the shutdown risk that existed last fall, you were supportive of potentially signing on to a discharge petition with Democrats in order to avoid that happening. It ultimately was not actually necessary in that case. But now there's talk of a discharge petition to make sure the supplemental package passed by the Senate gets a vote in the House if Mike Johnson doesn't put it on the floor. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, uh, you know, a government shutdown would impact the American people. And that is my first uh, priority, which is why uh, I would use a discharge to avoid a government shutdown uh, if necessary. Uh, with respect to the supplemental, I support aid to Israel. I support aid to Ukraine. I support aid to Taiwan. Russia, China, and Iran uh, have engaged in an unholy alliance that seeks to undermine and destabilize the United States. So we do need to get foreign aid. Uh, but there needs to be a process here, uh, and we are working through that in the House. Uh, the Senate finally passed something. Uh, for all the talk about the House, the Senate uh, moves slower than molasses. So they finally passed something, uh, and now the House will, uh, you know, get about the business of working through that. Uh, but it's a negotiation. It is not just accept what the Senate sends you. Uh, and I think people need to recognize that both in the press uh, and in the White House, uh, that, you know, the American people elected us uh, to serve as a Republican House majority, serve as a check and balance. The administration has still not answered many questions on the war in Ukraine uh, that have been presented by Congress. Uh, and so, you know, as we work through this supplemental aid package, my objective is to get something passed. Uh, but there needs to be consensus and there needs to be a negotiation. All right. Congressman Mike Lawler, the Republican from New York, thank you so much for your time this evening, sir. We appreciate it.
Now let's Thanks. get some final reaction from our political panel in our last few minutes here. Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies, and Jim Kessler, third way executive vice president, are still with us. So, Maura, you just heard the congressman there saying he is supportive of aid for Israel and Ukraine. This just needs to be, I guess, gone about in the correct way. Some negotiation should be had here. So who needs to have that negotiation to get this done? Speaker Johnson needs to bring this bill to the floor. I mean, I don't really see. So another that's way the of negotiation, just allowing people to vote on it. Allow people to vote on it. Work to, to work the will of the House is to do that. Is to allow members to bring amendments to the floor. It's to have this debate on the floor. Uh, and until they do that, and in the short time they have left in, in, in Congress to do this, I, I just don't see another way around it. If this gets chopped up into pieces, we've already seen a swing at Israel uh, standalone funding. Maybe there's another bill for Ukraine and a third for Taiwan. Do any of them pass? If it's chopped into pieces, it has to be choreographed so that everyone knows that each of those pieces are going to pass and the votes are counted in each of those places. Mm -hmm. Do you have confidence that the House of Representatives under Mike Johnson, that they know how to count votes? Because I don't. Does that sound unlikely <laughs> to you? What, I mean, it, probably. Like, honestly, I just don't know that that's going to happen. I also just think that this comes down to a messaging thing. There's a lot of opportunities for both sides to be better messengers on this. Uh, and I think for those Republicans like Michael Aller who want to support a, a bill that not only does it provide foreign aid, but it really does put money here in our economy right. and our security. Messaging that to their voters and to their constituents is going to be paramount, and they should be doing it already. We ran out of time with the congressman, but it's worth noting that he, of course, comes from a district very nearby, New York 3, where a Democrat won last night. He's one of the Republicans that represents a district Biden won in 2020. Does Mike Lawler have reason to be concerned after last night's result? He should be paying attention to it, that's for sure. I don't think that New York 3 was necessarily a bellwether for the 2024 election, but it's certainly, again, it's, it's we're, as Republicans, we are letting Democrats take over the messaging on something that has long been a strong Republican message. New York 3 is one of about six seats uh, in yep. New York expected to be determined here by some very close margins. Maura Gillespie and Jim Kessler, we thank you both for great insights today. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.